Our energy requirements are tiny compared to the amount of energy that the sun provides to the earth. Uh, human consumption of energy is only you know, a few hundredths or thousandths of the portion that's made available by the sun. So our part in the total budget is trivial. We can practically ignore it. But the earth in some ways does operate like a giant heat engine. It does move weight against the force of gravity and against the force of friction. As we follow the path that sunlight would take to try to warm the earth, and in this model it's designed like an oven, not a greenhouse, you can see that the uh, things being blamed for overheating the earth are essentially cooling it at almost every stage. Well, on the sunlight, when the sunlight comes in, it's depicted as entering through a hole, much like the hole in the oven. So it doesn't get in very efficiently. And the roof of the oven is made up of things derived from water and carbon dioxide. The big reflectors are typically ice crystals. So the sunlight trying to get in has a 30% loss that's bounced off somewhere on the earth. Typically most of it's in clouds. Then the sunlight has to get down to the surface of the earth and in the tropics about 80% of the earth's surface is water. So that water does not necessarily have to warm up. In fact, the, at the higher the temperature, the more likely it is that it will give off water and carbon dioxide, much like a person sweats. So the water and the carbon dioxide are cooling the system once again, just like a person's body on a warm day. When originally referring to the way the Earth's atmosphere works as the greenhouse effect, that was a, a paradox or an oxymoron because an effect as de properly defined in physics is supposed to be supported by a theoretical explanation that's derived from first principles, that is things you can prove through experimental observation. When you have a law in physics, that means it's supported by all the experimental evidence we have available. And the laws of thermodynamics are the most well supported because they've been tested over and over by people's attempts to build perpetual motion machines. When you go from the greenhouse model of the Earth, which doesn't work the way it's described, to the oven model, then you get an even less efficient version of what you're originally trying to do with the greenhouse. The idea of the greenhouse is that it has to be as nearly 100% transparent as possible to the incoming light from the sun. Because if you lose even a tiny fraction of that light, you can't make up the difference by catching the radiation going outward from the earth. When you get the light from the sun it's given off by something that's 5870 degrees Kelvin or so, so add 273 to that and that's the temperature of the sun in degrees Celsius. The more, the hotter I should say, the source of radiation, the more energy can be squeezed out of it. You essentially get something from a, a source of heat by by sucking out the heat from it. And eventually you get to a point where you can't take out any more. The, the closer you get to absolute zero, the harder it is to pull any more energy out in the form of heat. So the sources that are the hottest have the most energy to, to give. If you try to design a solar electric panel, one that will convert sunlight to electricity, you have to have direct sunlight to make it work. If the sunlight's bounced around and been weakened in the Earth's atmosphere, or if you try to run the panel on radiation given off by the Earth, a weakened version of sunlight, then it won't work. If you want to have a solar heater for heating water to run through a swimming pool, then it's also best to get the, sun, the sun's sunlight directly. You can save a tiny amount of heat by, say, covering up your tomato plants at the end of the summer when it's starting to freeze. 
by putting a blanket or a sheet of, of uh, plastic over your garden. But the amount of heat you can save that way is very small. You might make a degree or two difference to keep the plants from freezing, but that's about all you can do. So what matters is getting all the sunlight in that you possibly can if you want to heat something well. Once you've gone from a 6,000 degree temperature down to about a 300 degree, degree temperature, then you've lost at least 95% of the heating capacity of the radiation. Once you get the radiation striking the Earth's top layer of ground or the ocean, then the effect that you can get from putting radiation, especially into the water, can be put off in a way because instead of heating you get evaporation instead. Instead of giving off radiation in return, the ocean sheds mass in the form of water vapor and carbon dioxide. Much like what will happen if you warm up a can of pop, if you let it evaporate, if you shake it, or if you take the cap off. All of these things put energy into the water and the carbon dioxide and especially force the carbon dioxide out. The fizz will leave the pot. And that is a very energy consuming process. So by the time you've got the 30% of the incoming sunlight that's reflected off by clouds and also by the snowier parts of the earth, and then you've added on the 20% or so that's consumed by evaporating carbon dioxide and water, putting them into the atmosphere, you've lost at least 50% of your original strength of your sunlight. So if we had just a straight nitrogen atmosphere and a, a surface that had been hit by meteorites and turned sooty and dusty, it was just ground up rocks, we would most likely have a much warmer planet. What carbon dioxide and water do is once they're put into the air, and if you're in a, par a warmer part of the earth where water can, water vapor can make up a fair percentage of the air mass, then water vapor is a relatively light molecule. And if it's a couple percent or more of the total, which you can get under warm conditions, it will humidify the air and essentially make it lighter because Two nitrogens make an atomic weight of 14, two oxygens may make a weight of 16, and a water molecule is only 10. So, if, you put humidif if humidified air is lighter than dry air, it will start to rise. When water and carbon dioxide make their journey up through the atmosphere, they take heat with them. So they're essentially bypassing the effect they're blamed for creating. And by being emitted, they're taking heat away from the earth rather than keeping it in. So when carbon dioxide and water get higher up, then they eventually get to the point where the air cools enough. It can't carry those gases anymore. They condense or freeze and they give off radiation from there. But that radiation is, is weakened and it doesn't have the same frequency that it did when it was given off by the sun. And it's no longer able to travel straight through the atmosphere as depicted on the right side of the diagram with the thick red arrows symbolizing radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. The water and carbon dioxide will stop the very radiation that's depicted as taking a straight line path up to and down from the cloud layer in the atmosphere. They won't let that through. And radiation, when it's given off, say from the Earth's surface as depicted in the diagram, is given off in every possible direction. That's also the case from the sun. So the arrows in the diagram should be the net result of transport of radiation into and out of the diagram, to the left and right, as well as up and down. From the sun, we're just getting 
all the photons, the units of radiation, that just happen to be pointed in just the right direction to reach the Earth. Lots of other radiation went out at odd angles to the Sun's surface that weren't pointed directly toward Earth. Now, when you try to do the same thing with the infrared radiation coming off the Earth, it won't be pointed the right way to make a straight line path. And it also can't take that straight line path because it'll be stopped by the water and the carbon dioxide. Very gases that are depicted in the diagram. So what happens in order for this diagram to work is that you have to say that the carbon dioxide are more or less saying, well, I'll, since you're infrared, I'll let you through and I'll let you go back to the Earth's surface. I'll let you go by this time. And the stuff going out was saying, well, I'll let you pass by. Rather than being carried up and down by air currents and so on. And this is the equivalent of a famous paradox in physics called Maxwell's demon. When you have air molecules and they're all there, they have a temperature, it's an average temperature. Some of the molecules are colder than others, some are hotter than others, and some give off different frequencies of radiation. So someone was trying to figure out how would you design a way to get energy out of this because you need a heat flow, a heat difference in order for heat to flow and for work to be done. So he thought, well, suppose there were a supernatural creature, we'll call it a demon, and it, was it would be intelligent and it would sort out all the different molecules in the system and say, okay, you're a slightly warmer one, I'll put you over in this room. And you're a bit of a radiation that could cause a bit more heating, so I'll put you in that room too. And those of you who are a little colder or can generate a little bit less heat if you're received, I'll put you over here. And eventually the, the demon would sort out all these differences and create two subsets of a system, one hot and one cold. And then it would essentially create an energy source out of nothing. This, of course, can't happen. Could, the demon would have to have magical, supernatural powers in order to accomplish this because someone trying to do that sort of sorting would have to do a tremendous amount of work to separate the warmer portions of the system from the colder portions. Radiation, as depicted with the thick red arrows, can also be moving it around in a way that makes no difference overall to the system, as inside a, a thermos. You can have air that's never contacted the atmosphere. It's been brought up from depth in a thermos, for instance, where the temperature was 20 degrees Celsius or so from below ground. Bring that up and it's isolated from the rest of its surroundings and there will be 300 and some watts per square meter bouncing around inside the thermos. So you could model that one tiny portion of the atmosphere, describe that, that air inside the thermos, according to Stefan's law. But when you try and scale it up on a large scale, then it doesn't work so well. You could try to model the entire atmosphere as a whole succession of interconnected, slightly leaky thermoses, one, one leading to the next one. But you'd still have to have an active transfer, as if by an intelligent supernatural being, to make the radiation flow in the directions you wanted, as shown in the, in the diagram. It would be more like a reverse Maxwell's demon, because the Maxwell's demon de paradox depends on a gatekeeper being that sits at the junction of two partitions in a system and sorts the molecules in radiation so that one partition ends up warmer than the other one. But this depiction is more like a demon that works to sort everything so that the radiation ends up the same everywhere. So he has a work, uh, demon who has to work not with, between just one chamber, but a whole multitude of chambers interconnected to span the distance from the ground or the top of the sea up to the cloud deck. And then is doing all that work to make sure that nothing really happens in the end. <laughs> so he'd be uh, an extremely hard-working Maxwell's demon. <laughs>